Hello again from Video Land. Uh, today we're going to continue our discussion of uh, the water module, the water issue, and we're continuing to discuss how water might be resold once it's purchased as one of the many users from a large pool, literally and figuratively, a pool in the sense that many users may tap into a river or to a lake. If one of those users is a big user like San Antonio Water System, they've got to decide how to resell their water and how they decide to do that makes a big difference in terms of the overall demands on the bigger pool of water and makes a big difference in terms of water projects and efficient use or inefficient use of that source. All right, so you're familiar with, uh, well, here I can, <laughs> I can show the one that we had that I showed for San Antonio Water System. I wrote down there, also Las Vegas. Uh, one of your readings is about how Las Vegas is trying to do its water situation and for us here in San Antonio, the marginal cost, that big old flat low line down there, that's the Edwards Aquifer. Lots and lots of cheap water, but uh, but not unlimited. You know, at some point, if we go past that point where my uh, big finger is there, uh, then we've got a steep hill to climb to get to the next uh, the next uh, uh, water source. The marginal cost of that. Well, in uh, in Las Vegas, Lake Mead is the big source right down here. Okay, but then beyond Lake Mead, the one source they were talking about was a 300-mile pipeline to some corner of Nevada where they could find, where they were able to find some groundwater rice not uh, not already taken. All right. So anyway, so there's that. But today we're going to move back to something more conventional looking because while this graph does illustrate something quite important, namely that there's typically several sources that are of increasing cost contributing to a an entity's uh, supply of water. Uh, it has its limitations in terms of demonstrating certain things, and so we'll go back to uh, a more normal looking graph. It's not especially normal looking for this course, but uh, when you took principles and or intermediate, and I'm only assuming you took principles, you saw a graph like this uh, in your chapter that talked about costs, and there's the average cost, marginal cost, and then on this graph, uh, oh, and then the average cost always equals the marginal cost at the average cost minimum. Oops, I didn't draw them quite through the midpoint there. Close enough. Uh, and then we have two alternate demand lines on there to talk about a couple of different possibilities and how, once again, with growth, things things can change, and things can change big time. All right, so one of the possibilities that we see in many places uh, is flat fee billing. Maybe just totally collecting all their money via flat fee or collecting some of their money via a flat fee uh, because of the desire to even out revenues from from high water availability to low water availability times and, and to be totally clear on that it's the low water availability times when revenues are high because people are watering their lawns and and such uh, landscaping uh, when water is plentiful from mother nature people don't water their lawns as much and places uh, agencies like SAW, San Antonio Water System, uh, they're suffering in terms of their revenue flow. I've talked to some of the folks down there and they've, they've just got money coming out of their ears. They're financing research projects, hiring consultants during dry times and then during wet times they're tightening belts and firing consultants and not hiring economists like me to, to do benefit cost analysis for them. Okay, so back to this graph and we'll pretend this is the uh, SAW situation and it really is the situation in a very general sense of just about anybody doing anything. The, the average cost tends to start out uh, over here, tends to start out uh, at some reasonably high level okay, over here and then it declines as we uh, as we boost the system up to some more efficient usage level and then as the inefficiencies start to creep in you know the marginal cost tends to rise and that's that's just the, the way it is for for uh, virtually all entities based on the fact that they have a uh, fixed uh, capital supply in the short run okay so let's for exa for example to uh, assume that that the demand level is d0 and that either because of policy they're lazy uh, or politics uh, or they just don't meet or water that they have to bill users typically households not individual people but but homes businesses households for now uh, just through a flat fee okay so what does that mean that means that they have 
a certain revenue requirement, uh, and then they just divide that up among the households. It's not usually evenly because some households and some users are bigger than others, so it might be according to meter size, but we'll, we'll let all that complexity uh, not bother us, and we'll just assume that they're all charged the same amount. Okay, so with demand D0, okay, you see it on there, okay, that line that goes down from, from uh, up here, okay, all the way down to point B, okay, that's the demand. Then if we have a flat fee, then we're going to have demand at point B, right, because with a flat fee, there's no change in the amount that you owe based on the amount you use, and in, in effect, water is free. I mean, you're, you're paying for it but you're not paying more when you use more. So at the margin, it's free, and that's what matters in terms of people choosing how much to consume. Okay, so at point B, we say that there's quite a deadweight loss, area A, B, C, because beyond point A, where price equals marginal cost, right, which we know is the efficient pricing level, uh, beyond uh, point A, each additional increment of water costs more, right, from A to C, costs more, then it's worth, which is from A to B. It's not worth, not worthless, but line segment AB on the demand line indicates that the water past point A has a value lower than the opportunity cost of delivering it from point A to C. So this would be like our, you know, our graph from earlier, where the uh, staircase is above the demand line indicating, in some cases indicating that you would have a, uh, a deadweight loss occurring from overconsumption, right? So you can see that uh, that uh, flat fee pricing is expensive in terms of the, what has to be provided because people will see it as a free good and they'll want to consume lots and lots of water, fill up swimming pools and have lush landscaping because they know whatever their water bill is, it's not going to change with the amount that they use. And let me draw another dot on here just to illustrate what we mean by the uh, billing requirement. Okay, so with... Uh, Call that point J. Okay, so point J that I just drew on there, right there, right off my index finger, point J. All right, that's the average cost with flat fee billing with demand line D0. Okay, so area JB all the way over to the y axis, this whole area, I know you can't see it at the moment, this whole area right here. Okay, that area that I just shaded in with my pen, so the kind of the faint line there, that's the total cost of providing quantity B. Let me go ahead and put a Q there. Okay, quantity at point B, uh, which is the amount that's going to be demanded with a uh, flat fee billing policy. All right, so expensive and uh, not efficient in the sense that there's going to be a... Uh, uh, a large dead weight loss. All right, so suppose we go to average cost pricing. All right, what's that going to mean? Okay, well, let's find out where D0 intersects the average cost. Let me go ahead and mark that on there. Okay, so that's here at point, uh, call that uh, point M. Okay, so there we are at point M. think I'm going to need to stop here. Hopefully we haven't lost this whole amount because the screen is frozen. All right. Well, we looked at uh, flat fee billing, at least the beginnings of it. In a lot of places, it's not practiced as just totally flat fee billing. For example, in San Antonio, you get your water bill, and there'll be a flat fee on there. And in addition to that, there'll be a charge per unit of water you used. Uh, as I said earlier, sometimes that happens, not, not here, but sometimes flat fee billing happens because there isn't any water meters. And so that's just to divide up the cost of all the water that people use, and uh, that's, that's your monthly bill. Uh, now, a lot of places have discovered that that can be very expensive. So let's just touch on that real quick. First of all, looking at our graph, we can see that if we uh, have Q sub B consumption, we have to go up to the... Uh, uh, up to the AC line, and I see that the, uh, the the J right there is pretty hard to read. Let me just go scribble down here for a second and make that a little easier to read. That's point J. Okay, and then 
with quantity at Q sub B, J is on the average cost line, and so taking Q sub B on the average cost line, up to the average cost line, uh, we see what the uh, total cost is if we multiply that uh, that quantity Q sub B times the P sub J. We'll just go ahead and put that on there. Okay, and P sub J is where if you take point J over to the uh, Y axis. All right, so P sub J times Q is the uh, uh, is the total cost. Okay, and then with the dead weight loss A B uh, C for demand line D one. Okay, so I was saying that some places that don't have metering. Uh, install it because at some point it just becomes unacceptably costly to meet all of the demand that'll occur at a price of zero. So, for example, if you if you consider the fact that a lot of places see increased demand, look at over at D1. If you go over here to where D1 hits the x-axis, that'll be the quantity. My index finger is there. That'll be the quantity consumed with demand level D1 and just flat fee pricing. Uh, the way I drew my graph, you can't even get up to the to the average cost line, okay? From from uh, this quantity down here, you go way way up here. I mean, the average cost line isn't even drawn far enough to that, and and way up to the you could get up to the uh, average cost line, and then you'd have to have this price to break even on that uh, that level. So that would have to be the average charge that you would make per unit of water through your flat fee. Uh, very, very costly. So a demand shift from D0 to D1 it could readily, could certainly trigger someone saying, look, uh, we've got to install water meters. Okay, so back back to D0. You see what happens if you do that, if you start charging per unit, even if you inefficiently, although much less inefficient than flat fee billing, if you use average cost pricing, now we're going to be at point M. And again, sorry for my pen being somewhat faint. Point M is where the D0 hits the average cost line, and that uh, at that price, which is a little bit below P sub J, even though P sub J is just is right there on the Y axis. Uh, I don't want to put too many prices on there, but at at, uh, at point with point M, at that price, your books balance, but you have a dead weight loss because in this case, okay, you're actually underselling, under providing water, right? Because with demand level D0, marginal cost is above average cost. Uh, and so as, as a result, uh, I'm sorry, marginal cost is below average cost. So it, with that being the case, if you use the efficient pricing policy at P0, you're going to lose money. Okay, so, but but you should still do that. Now you're wondering, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, we have to balance the books. We, gotta, we have to have enough money to, to finance all this good stuff, this water, but pay for it. We don't want to pay for it out of tax revenue, although... That does happen at times, like SAWS has occasionally gone to city council and asked for money to cover their uh, their losses over a particular time period. All right, so point A indicates the efficient price at demand level D0, but point A is below the average cost line. Okay? So that red shaded area, and I don't know how well that shows up, this red shaded area right there is a loss if we practice efficient pricing with demand level D0. Again, Efficient pricing means set the price equal to the marginal cost. So how do, how do we sustain efficient pricing in the face of marginal cost being below average cost? Well, a flat fee. Ah, see, this is the one case. I'll wipe my finger on the screen here. This is the one case, okay, with marginal cost being below average cost. Okay, with price equals marginal cost. This is the one case where you do want to use a flat fee, where it's efficient to do that. Okay, and how big should your flat fee be? I've written that down here to make sure that that red area is covered. Okay, so you set your price equal to marginal cost, and then you set a flat fee equal to the difference between marginal cost and average cost. Okay, uh, although I think I wrote it backwards because the average cost is the one that's bigger. Uh, let me go ahead and do that, fix that. Okay, I mean, the average, okay, AC minus MC. Okay, so average cost is bigger than marginal cost. Okay, so that difference times the amount consumed with price equal marginal cost. Okay, that dollar amount has to be divided up among the, the end users via a flat fee. Okay, monthly, annual, whatever. Anyway, that's that has to be covered by the flat fee. Other than marginal cost being less than average cost, don't use a flat fee. Now, I say that even though 
places like SAWS do it to even out their revenues over time. And I say, that isn't needed even then, right? because you can practice what I call rainy day fund pricing. In this case, literally. Now, you may have heard the term rainy fund day fund from from uh, from fiscal use in like in the state legislature or something where they deposit money in, in an account during a good year to allow spending to grow normally in a bad year in terms of revenue. Right, but this this case, this is literally a rainy day fund, right? Because then you, you would apply some of the high revenues during dry times to have that be available to cover what would otherwise be losses uh, during wet times. Okay? So you don't ever need to use a flat fee except when marginal cost is less than average cost uh, with price equal to marginal cost at that level. All right, so let me see if I want to talk about anything else on this graph before we move on. All right, so in the San Antonio case, which is common, uh, they have that flat fee rate mostly to stabilize revenues, but it could be just to pay to cover the uh, capital costs, and then the water bill uh, just reflects the average variable cost of the operating expenses of the system. That's also inefficient. The reason that is is because the price signal is is uh, uneconomically low. The price signal the price signal doesn't reflect the cost uh, the capital cost of the water system. And so that's one of the reasons I, for example, I've told San Antonio Water System, get rid of your flat fee. Use this rainy day concept. That way you can cover the, raise the same amount of revenue, not, not more revenue, raise the same amount of revenue with a higher price. Okay, and with a higher price then you, you incentivize conservation and you have less water projects to build over time and you save a lot of money that way. Okay, so price equals marginal cost is efficient. Always do that. If price equals marginal cost with marginal cost above average cost, no need to have that flat fee. Okay, because you're, you, in that case, you have excess revenue. You have that political problem that we've talked about uh, in the last video that says, uh, we're making money selling water. That's embarrassing, even though there's nothing inefficient or inherently bad about it. The city has to find its money for the cops and the firemen and whatever someplace. But anyway, it tends to be politically incorrect, and so we can use the two-tier pricing uh, that we talked about in the last video and in class uh, that says the first tier, the, the first price that anybody faces for the first increments of water they use is real low, okay, which also helps low-income households. And then the second price in the, in the two-price arrangement uh, is the one that reflects the marginal cost of putting water into the system, and in some cases it reflects the uh, marginal cost uh, uh, of expanding the system. Right? In some cases the water use is pushing at the capacity of the system, and then a uh, marginal user cost approach would say, you know, that's you ought to charge that. That builds up money in advance to pay for that imminent expansion in the water system. And indeed, you have to do that because you have to have the new supply on hand when the criteria uh, for new supply is met, namely that the rationing price is, it, is more than the, uh, for the existing supply, it is more than it would cost to expand the supply. We covered that in a, in a previous video. Okay, so in, if furthermore, uh, in addition to all of that, uh, that isn't complicated enough, hopefully it's not, uh, we also want to have peak and off-peak pricing, okay? and that saves on storage facility construction and building bigger or smaller pipes is to charge more during peak periods, and so people use a little less then, and so the, uh, the pipes that you build and the uh, reservoirs that you have aren't uh, uneconomically large. All right, we're ready now to uh, move on to how one would appropriately uh, construct a market, okay? So you start off from a situation that's inefficient. Maybe it used to be efficient, like our Edwards Aquifer situation, till the water itself became scarce. You know, it didn't make any sense to bill for anything other than the cost of pumping it out of the ground and delivering it to folks, homes, and businesses. Okay, and since that's sort of a good time to break uh, the video, I'm just gonna I'm gonna stop here on on this one and uh, start again in a minute on the the other one. Of course, it may be several hours before you view this next one, but uh, we'll be talking about how to set up water markets uh, when I come back in my time, a couple minutes. All right, so see you shortly.